Good morning, Countryside. I'd like to ask everybody to just come on in from the hallways and to find your way to your seats. My name's Joshua Johansson. I'm one of the young men preparing for a pastoral ministry here at Countryside. And I'd like to welcome everyone who is here, especially if you're visiting with us for the first time. So welcome to Countryside. I'd also like to welcome everyone who's in the overflow room. And just a reminder for everyone, that room over there, the commons, which we refer to as the overflow room, we need to utilize that a little bit more. So if you are a church member, uh, take turns sitting in there some time to allow for space in here for our guests. Uh, one other reminder before we start, we'll be celebrating communion again, so you can find those cups by the doors on the tables. And uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, thank you so much that we have this privilege to come together as your church body and to be able to worship together, Lord. Just prepare all of our hearts as we come into your presence. Clear our minds from any distractions, God, so that we could be just be fully dedicated to you during this hour. I just pray that our worship in prayer and the songs that we are about to sing to you and in the teaching that we're going to hear from your word, we'll just glorify you, Lord. And it's your name. Amen. Go ahead and stand.
grace of God has reached for me. And pulled me from the raging sea. And pulled me from the raging sea. And I am safe on the solid ground. And I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is our salvation. The Lord is my salvation. will help. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like? Who is like the thinking about those words this morning, um, and I think we had to, a little bit more than usual, to consider those truths, uh, but good to be reminded of the Lord who is our salvation this morning, and as we come to 
this portion of our service where we celebrate communion, uh, you can all be seated. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to grab uh, one of the cups off of the back tables, you can do that now. Um, they're at the back of the auditorium by each door. And in the overflow room, there's a table in the back there as well. And this morning, as we, we come to the Lord's table, um, what, what these songs have done for us and, and what we're going to do here as we consider um, a truth about Jesus' death is we, we must draw our minds to the cross. Um, this wooden structure that we have on the wall behind me here, um, it reminds us of where our hope lies. It reminds us of the suffering and death that Jesus has gone through on our behalf. And so this morning we come together to remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Lord is our salvation. So if you're a believer this morning, um, you're welcome to join us in communion. Even if you're not a member here, if you're just visiting, if you're a Christian this morning, meaning you've repented of your sin, you've trusted Christ by faith, then you are welcome and encouraged uh, to partake with us this morning. If you're not a believer this morning, if you've never trusted Christ for salvation, or if you are living in unrepentant sin, if you're under church discipline from this church or any other church, uh, we would just ask that you refrain from uh, participating this morning, and instead to watch and listen to the gospel and see the truth of the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus, and what that means for you, instead of partaking this morning. So as we prepare to eat and drink together, let's take a few moments while the musicians play, um, just to consider our own hearts. This is a time to reflect, to consider um, sin that we have partaken in this week that needs to be confessed before God. This is a time to repent of our sin, to come to Christ and find forgiveness. So as the musicians play, um, just open your heart to God this morning. Go ahead and open uh, the, the top on your communion cup. We'll just get that out of the way. That way we can, uh, we can focus on truth of the gospel instead of worrying about when to open our communion cup. All right, this morning, what I want us to consider together is the truth that Jesus' broken body and his shed blood have provided us with friendship with God. Because of Jesus' death, we are made friends with God. And this might seem like a really simple thought, and it is, as so we consider what, what friendship is and what it means to be a friend of God. Uh, but I think it's really profound at the same time to consider the truth that we can be friends with God. Because who is God? God is the creator of the universe. God is all-powerful and all-knowing. And we are made his friends. And what we're going to see here in a moment is how that is a miracle in and of itself. Now, humans were created to be friends with God. We were created to have a relationship with God. When, when God saw Adam in the garden... He said, it is not good for Adam to be alone. Adam had no friends. And so God created 
a friend for him in Eve. But beyond that even, at an even deeper level, man is made for relationship with God and friendship. So think about what a friend is really quickly. Um, A friend is someone who you know very deeply and someone who knows you very deeply. So there's a mutual knowledge of one another. This is someone you don't have to be, you don't have to pretend around. This is someone who actually knows you, who knows who you are. This is someone who you don't have to earn favor from because they know you and they love you. They know you at your worst, and you know them at their worst. That is, in a human friendship, um, that's what it means to be a friend. Another aspect of friendship is um, someone that you enjoy being around. You enjoy their company. You enjoy being with them. A friend is a companion, someone who you know is on your side, someone who's going to have your back, who is traveling life together with you. And a friend is someone you love, not necessarily in a romantic way, and that's not the relationship we're going to see described this morning, but in a way that sacrifices for them and puts their needs above your own. So friendship um, is distinct from an acquaintance, colleagues, even family members. There's something deeper going on with friendship. The, in Proverbs, we see that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So as Jesus goes to the cross the night before he dies, this is what he sends, says to his disciples in John 15, verses 12 through 15. He says, Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. Then he looks at his disciples and says this, You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And here Jesus is saying something profound to his disciples. As he calls them his friends and describes the greatest friend being the one who lays down his life for his friends. Because our greatest problem is our greatest need, and that is to be reunited in friendship with God. We don't have time this morning to look everywhere where this is described, but we see humans described in their relationship with God as estranged, alienated, separated from God, enemies of God, haters of God, hostile to Him, actively rebellious against Him in every way. We're described in our humanity as ungodly, unrighteous, unwilling, disobedient. And that is the description of Jesus' disciples in the room when he's saying these words. They have, they have never gotten the things that he's said, and they're going to betray him and flee from him. And Jesus calls them his friends. In our, in our natural state, uh, we're described as anything but what you would consider a friend of God. So with that description of humanity in mind, hear the description of Jesus when he says, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. God has done the work through his son, Jesus Christ, to change your relationship from enemy to friend, from rebel to son. You are friends of God. And this means that Jesus' death changes something fundamental about how you relate to God. And so what we see from our truest friend, our friend Jesus, is this. A true friend lays down his life for his friend, and Jesus does that on the cross. When he takes your death on himself and lays his life down for his friends. A true friend encourages obedience to their master. And Jesus says that to, his, to his, his friends. He says, I no longer call you friends, but, but son, I'm sorry, I no longer call you slaves, but friends, because you're sons. So follow me and obey my commandments. And my commandment is to love one another. A true friend shares all that he has with his friends, and Jesus shares everything 
with his friends. He hasn't held anything back, but he's revealed everything that we need to know so that we can know the Father. So marvel at this truth this morning. Because of the shed blood and broken body of our friend Jesus, we are friends not only of one another as we come in this room together, but we are friends of God himself. And on that same night that Jesus shared that truth with his disciples, he lifted the cup and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. So this morning we remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus that makes us his friend. This morning as we prepare um, to eat the bread together, one of our deacons, Josh Johansson, is going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we are absolutely undeserving, just as sinners, God, of your grace, of your mercy, of your forgiveness. Yeah, thank you, God, as we think about this truth that we just heard from your word, that despite being enemies of you, that you have reached out to those you have saved and made us part of your family. And thank you, Lord, for the ultimate example of a, of a friend that you gave in dying on the cross for us. Thank you for the bread that we are about to take that reminds us of your body that was broken on the cross for us, for our sins. Just thank you for that, God. It's in your name. Amen. Let's eat together. Another one of our deacons, Dave Lammersmice, if you would pray as we prepare to drink the juice together. Amen. Let's drink together. All right, and you can stand as we continue to worship this morning. Alright, I'm not sure if this is coming through in the overflow room, but uh, we do have words on the back wall there. A little unorthodox, but uh, if everyone wants to take a look. We're good. Alright, fantastic. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Alright, let's sing. My worth is not in what I own. Not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame.
Lord, I pray that you just help us this morning to set aside any distractions and that you would guide our minds and our hearts into your truth this morning. Thank you so much for this opportunity for us to reflect on the sacrifice that you made for our salvation and the friendship that we have in you. Thank you so much for your love and thank you for this time. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless it and guide our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As um, <clears throat> we were uh, going through some of the difficulties this morning, I uh, had a flashback. Remember in the old days, Mike, when we had this thing called an overhead projector? <laughs> and uh, sometimes the bulb wouldn't work or it'd blow out or the, the person couldn't keep up with the verses or the wrong verses and all that. And we've come a long way, baby, on technology. We love it. It just shows us how dependent we are on technology. It's dangerous, isn't it? Well, over the uh, last few weeks, um, the associate pastors have been in the uh, book of Micah. So you can turn to Micah chapter 2. That's where we're going to head this morning. Um, for those of you that are visiting, we're actually in two different books. When Mike, our lead teaching pastor, is teaching, he's teaching from the book of Acts. And then the rest of us, when we are uh, preaching up here on Sundays, we're going to be in the book of Micah. We've identified the theme of Micah as the faithfulness of a fearsome God is the foundation of our hope. 
Micah is addressing the unfaithfulness of God's people, Israel, and he proclaims three oracles or declarations against them. We're currently looking at the first one, and it includes chapter 1 and chapter 2. We've seen in chapter 1 that God in his mercy calls the whole earth to listen to his warning against Israel. Micah announced that God would crush the idol worship and he would get Israel's attention. He described the coming judgment on the northern kingdom, Israel, in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. See, God is always faithful and he desires faithfulness from his followers. He alone deserves our worship. This was where Israel had failed. In disobedience, they went after other gods. Now, in the last section of chapter 1, we see Micah announcing the coming judgment on the cities that were outlining Israel. God, in his faithfulness, throws out a lifeline to them by calling on them to respond to his correction. And we know when we look at history that there will be a time during Hezekiah's reign that they will respond to God's correction, but that will be short-lived, and we know that judgment and exile awaits them. So in our text today, we have charges against the people of Israel and Judah in particular. Again, it's the mercy of God that he sends prophets to his people to warn them of judgment for failure to obey. And just like we as parents, we've all lived through this, haven't we? Given our children warning about things that are destructive for them, like uh, don't play with matches or don't play in the street or don't eat bugs. Maybe some of you allow your kids to eat bugs, I don't know. Why do we warn them? Why do we warn our kids? Because we love them, don't we? We don't want them to get hurt. God is faithful to his people. Just as a loving parent, he desires his children not to be destroyed. So he sends his prophets to warn them. Micah has warned his listeners about their sin and transgressions. But today we see in chapter 2 that he is specific in the sins that they are guilty of. So if you have turned to Micah chapter 2, that by the way, that's in the Old Testament. Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Let's go ahead and stand one more time. We'll read these verses and uh, then we can be seated. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, We are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people. How he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. You may be seated. I want you to notice, first of all, the devious schemes of evil men are exposed. That's what we see here. Schemes of evil men, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it's in their power, the power of their hands. They covet fields and they seize them, and houses, and they take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Now in the first chapter, Micah has addressed the transgressions of Israel in a general sense. But now we see him getting specific in his denunciation of the evil that is found in Judah. I want you to notice first the deliberate plan of evil is declared, verse 1. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. We know this is not a good thing, right, when you read that? 
because it's, in, uh, because it's in the power of their hands. We see here power and deception at work. That's what we see. The term woe is an expression of grief, indignation. It's a warning of judgment on those who practice evil. Well, what was it that they were doing? Well, first they, we see that they devise wickedness. The word devise carries the idea of inventing, calculating, planning something. They were planning wickedness, trouble, evil, mischief. Micah doesn't at this point get specific as to what they were planning, but we'll see in verse 2 what they were planning. They purposely planned evil and trouble. That's what these men were doing. But we also see that they work evil on their beds. They plan and they mentally commit to carry out bad and morally evil activities. This is deception actively practiced by evildoers with the purpose of hurting others. The term beds refers to the place where private thoughts and aspirations are entertained. These men spend sleepless hours calculating and scheming to acquire others' property by deceptive means. The mere fact that they did all of this through the night in private shows an intense effort generated by greed. They plan evil. And then we see in our verses that they engage their plans at first opportunity. When morning dawns, they perform all that the evil that they had planned to accomplish, they engage in it. Micah gives a reason why. Because they have the power to accomplish their plans. That's why. It's in the power of their hands. They have the ability to do so, so they did it. Now remember, Micah was prophesying to the people of Judah, so when he declares what was going on in secret, can you imagine what would have been in the minds of those that were actually doing it? The fact is, God knows what is happening in private. He knows what's in their hearts. It's not a surprise to God. God knows what is happening in private. He knows what's in the hearts of man. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10 says this, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And in Psalm chapter 44, verses 20 and 21, we're reminded If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to the foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. The heart is laid bare in the eyes of God. That's a good reminder for all of us here this morning. So we see the deliberate plan of an evil was declared. But notice next the deceptive act of evil is described in verse 2. Here's where Micah gets specific with what they were planning. Where we read, they covet fields and they seize them and houses and they take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. We see first that they violently steal property. They covet fields, they seize them, and houses, they take them away. Micah here accuses them of being covetous. To covet is a strong, uncontrollable desire for something. It's a violation of the Tenth Commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, and verse 17, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Micah's listeners would have known this. They are in direct 
violation of the Tenth Commandment. Our text says that they covet fields, that is, land property. They covet houses. These were homes where they lived. These evil, conspiring landlords in Judah were coveting the land, houses, the property of those who were poorer than they. By the way, this particular land that we're talking about represented a person's inheritance that was passed down from one generation to another. And it's important to know that in an agrarian economy, a person's life depended on the, lo- uh, the land that he had. And it was carefully protected by law. If a person lost his land, then he may very well end up as a slave. His freedom would be lost. You see, God's plan for his chosen people were to be free landowners, not slaves, sharecroppers, or hired laborers. They were to have a secured possession as a blessing from God that included enough land to support their families. When you read, and a lot of us have been reading through the Bible, and you see we're almost getting to the point where, um, well, we've got to the point where um, um, you see the kings and the judges and all that. You see uh, the, the, the children of Israel approaching the promised land, and God meets out in, in Joshua the, the different areas of land for each of the tribes. It was supposed to go to each of the, the families, each of the, the tribes of Israel. And it was a secured possession for them as a blessing from God. That was the plan. But the coveting eyes of these land barons acted in their covetousness. They violently took the land of the poor. That word seize has the idea of a violent transaction. It wasn't handled nicely. There's another example that kind of reflects what's going on here. Do you all remember Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings chapter 21? King Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard and the counsel of his wife Jezebel, by the counsel of his wife Jezebel, he ended up having Naboth killed so that he could have his vineyard. Do you guys remember that story? Well, that's what's going on here. They were violently taking property that wasn't theirs. But not only do they seize the land, but they take houses away. In other words, they they snatch, they steal away. It's like shoplifting. They take what wasn't theirs. They violently steal property. Secondly, they viciously defraud people. They oppress a man. They defraud, they violate, they extort. What did they extort? His house, the place that he lived, his inheritance, all that he owned, his property and possessions. And these wealthy landowners had the idea of, I want it, and I'm going to get it, regardless of means or the morals behind it. They were willing to fleece ordinary people under the guise of doing business efficiently. Ruthlessness was considered a virtue. Sounds like our culture today, doesn't it? It's just a good business practice. Just being efficient. In Micah's day, the small landowners who used the land to provide for his family was suddenly destitute. This injustice resulting from the greed and pride of the wealthy can only be addressed through the intervention of God. You see, a heart of greed cannot be halted by political action, economic reform, or education. The root problem was a heart problem. And only God can address the problem of the heart. I want to interject a truth that is very relevant, I think, at this point in our text. The focus in these verses have been on the evil actions of covetous landowners. But what about the people that they were defrauding, right? What about them? What would you think when the wicked wrongfully take what belongs to you? 
What would you do? What would your response be if that were to happen to you? Someone would come and just violently take what is yours. Would you think, I'm going to get even with them someday? Would you be tempted to exact revenge on the perpetrator? Isn't that what we would typically do? We would think, isn't this what our culture tells us today? You need to stand up for yourself. Don't let somebody take advantage of you. Don't get mad. What? Get even. It's what we're told. Well, that's not what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? Psalm 73 and verse 3 says, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It recognizes the problem with injustice. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You see, you're not the only one that's thought things like that. We will have these thoughts because unfair things happen, right? Unfair things happen. If you don't know it by now, life is not fair. If that's what you're going for, you'll never achieve it. You'll never see it. Life is not fair. But here's what God says. With all those thoughts, this is what God says. Psalm 37, verses 1 through 3 and verse 7. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. You see, God instructs us to not fret or worry, but wait on Him. We can be confident that a just God will act. Romans 12 and verse 19 says this, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And this is exactly what we see happening in the following verses. The devious schemes of evil men are exposed, but notice, secondly, the devastating justice of a fearsome God is exacted. We see this in verses 3 through 5. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster." And that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, We are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people. How he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Therefore you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. You see, the punishment fits the crime. The people who coveted more land and thought nothing of taking it from others will find themselves destitute of any possessions, and the invaders that take them will ridicule them. They will be forced to listen to their own lament thrown back at them. Notice first here, God's inescapable justice removes all pride. God has a way with taking care of pride, right? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Verse 3 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your neck, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. 
So who were the recipients of God's justice? No, it was the whole nation. For whom was God's punishment directed? In our verse here, it says against this family. The term family means clan, tribe, nation, in particular Judah. You see, the whole nation suffers for the sins of individuals within it. We see this with David, right, when he conducted a census against the will of God in 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 17. Here's what that verse says. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. As a side note, I think this is important for us when we look at this. When you sin, it doesn't just affect you. It can affect those around you. I know you've seen it before. It's like the ripple effect of water when you throw a rock into it. It ripples out from the point of impact, doesn't it? The sin of a spouse affects others. The sin of a mom or a dad affects the children. The sin of a church leader affects the church. You see, when Samaria fell in 722 B.C. and Jerusalem fell in 586, the righteous suffered with the wicked and went into exile and lost their land. The great I Am will exact the judgment He has planned. Just as the wicked devise wickedness, God is devising disaster. Next, notice the pervasiveness of God's justice. It's inescapable disaster. There is no escape. You cannot remove your necks. This describes a yoke of bondage that will be placed on them as they go into exile. Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 6 says this, I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. You showed them no mercy on the age you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. This was a description of the Babylonian captivity experienced by Israel. Yokes were used by farmers to control the oxen. And this phrase is a metaphor to describe what the conquering nation would do to Judah. They would be more powerful and thereby control everything they did. They would be slaves. This was the same type of treatment the land barons made the poor endure as they took their property away from them. There will be no pride. You shall not walk haughtily. When you're wearing a yoke, there will be no proud arrogance. Micah is warning the people who are taking the land from others would one day experience the removal of all pride. I think it's a good reminder that God hates pride. God hates pride. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13 says, Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. That's pretty clear. I don't think there's much questions about what God's trying to tell us there. He hates it. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 5 says, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. James chapter 4 and verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You see, our culture wants to celebrate and promote pride under the guise of having a positive self-image. You know, take care of number one. God hates pride, and he opposes it. Also, there will be a predetermined calamity. You see, our verse says it will be a time of disaster. It will be a time of calamity, of pain, and of grief. 
just as there was season for these land barons to cause pain in the lives of those they cheated, God has predetermined a pain for them as well. This is the sowing reaping principle in action. Galatians 6 and verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You see, there are consequences for choices that are made. The disaster and evil that these rich land czars inflicted on the poor landowners was going to come back on them. I think this is a truth that should both encourage us and challenge us this morning. If we live according to God's will, live in obedience to His truth, then we will experience blessing from Him. Wait a minute. I did not say that God will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's not what I said. But he will bless those who follow him. That is what Scripture says. Luke 11, verse 28 says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You see, if Israel would have done that, we wouldn't be reading all of this judgment that we see, right, in Micah. They didn't. God told Israel that he would bless them if they obeyed. The opposite was true. If you disobey and you ignore God's truth, then there would be cursing. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28. Don't we teach our children this truth when we discipline them? I hope we do. When they disobey, we discipline them. When they obey we should bless them we should acknowledge it reward them god's inescapable justice removes all pride in verse 4 in verse 5 we see god's devastating justice results in great loss in verse 4 it says in that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say we are utterly ruined He changes the portion of my people, how he has removed it from me. To an apostate, he allots our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in assembly of the Lord. Well, first of all, we see in verse 4 the loss of land. This will occur when God deems that it was time to occur in that day. The time that God allows disaster to come. The time when God is going to exact his judgment on the greedy. We see here that the enemy will mock. That's what we see in verse 4. They will, the enemy, take up a taunt song, a proverb or a byword, a song of mourning. They will moan bitterly or wail or lament. The enemy will taunt the defeated, greedy land barons by quoting their despairing lament. This is what these rich landowners heard from those that they were defrauding. Now it comes back from their own mouths. You see, God warned them of this kind of judgment in Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 37 says, And you shall become a whore, a proverb, and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. Where Israel was supposed to be the shining glory of God represented to all these other nations, they have become a byword, a whore. But notice the message in the enemies mocking. They were utterly ruined says, we are utterly ruined, we're devastated, we're destroyed. This is utter devastation brought on because of their greed. They were reaping what they sowed. This is what we call poetic justice. They were getting exactly what they deserved. Not only were they utterly destroyed, but they were completely plundered. He changes the portion of my people. The enemy confiscated their possessions. The territory of God's covenant people. 
This describes the plundering of the land by the enemy and the tearing down of strongholds. There was complete devastation by the enemy. Israel's land was plundered and much of it was destroyed. Now remember, this land was an inheritance given by God to each tribe of Israel. And God allows the enemy to seize it. Just like the greedy land barons did in verse 2. God apportioned the land to each tribe. It is His land. He chooses to whom it will belong. We need to remember that all we own is really owned by God. We are only stewards of what God has given us. This is why we should be content with what we have and not covet what others have, as these landowners did. You see, God has determined what each of us should have. Let me say that one more time. God has determined what each of us should have. He owns all that we have. And if you're a believer, He owns you. You see, so you have nothing. You own nothing. It's all God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 reminds us of this. You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your bodies. We simply own nothing. I mean, when you think about it, what happens with everything you own when you die? It goes to another. And what happens when they die? It goes to another. And what happens when they die? It goes to another. You see, the chain keeps going. So who owns it all? God. God owns it all. These greedy landowners forgot this truth, and now they're paying the price. They're utterly ruined, completely plundered, and they were left destitute. Our verse says, how he removes it from me. You see, Babylon came in, seized the property of these landowners. But not only did they seize their property, they gave it to what our verse says, apostates. The enemy gives or apportions their land to those who don't even follow God. This was referring to nations outside of the covenant relationship that Israel had with God. The Babylonians in this case. God in his fearsome justice exacts judgment on Israel for the greed of evil landowners who were taking advantage of of those with less God takes the land inheritance away from his people, and he gives it to this evil nation. What unthinkable judgment for this to happen. Remember, God is faithful to his promises, and he will always act with justice. They will experience the loss of land, but this isn't all they will lose. Next, we see that they will experience the loss of inheritance in verse 5, which means that they would be disconnected from the community of Israel. You see, Micah was prophesying that God's judgment on them would mean that they would have no representation in the redistribution of the land. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot. Now, when you read that, you go, well, what's that mean? It's talking about redistribution of, of land. There will be no one to throw a measuring cord or line to assign your portion, your land. You have no one to represent you so that you can stake a claim on the land. You see, there was a practice of a lottery taking place according as the marked stones were drawn. So it determined where the measuring line marking a family's allotment from another family's allotment should be placed. That's how they came up with who got what. And how they divided the land. What's interesting is God was overseeing all of this. As he's ultimately the one who decides who received what portion of the land. Remember, God owns everything. And he gives to each as he wants. And he uses this system to do exactly that. Proverbs 16 verse 33 clarifies that. The lot is cast into the lap. But it's every decision is from the Lord. The 
there has been a lot of judgment in our text. But did you catch a glimmer of hope in that text? There will come a day in the future that these people who were taken captive away from their land will return and the land will be reapportioned to them. These greedy people will have no part in it. And as a result, they would be excluded from the land and the life of the people of God. That was their punishment. You see, hope is seen in the fact that there will be a day when the exiles will be reunited with their land. You see, God is faithful and fearsome, and our hope is anchored in that reality. Let me suggest some implications in closing this morning. By the way, the first one's not in your notes, so you might want to just go down at the bottom and put this one. Be content with what God has given you. Be content with what God has given you. Just as God has apportioned land to Israel, God has apportioned everything for you. Be content. When you go out and get in your jalopy and you look next uh, next to you, there's parked a brand new Mercedes Benz or whatever you... Be content. When you go home and you don't have a garage to put your car in, but someone down the street has three-car garage, be content. Be content with what God has given you. Next, and this is the first one on your implication, trust in the justice of God. Trust in the justice of God. When you are wronged or you're mistreated, you can rest in the reality that God is just and he will make everything right. Now let me give you one clarification on this. It's in his time, not yours. It's God's time. Know for sure that God sees. And not only he sees what's going on, but remember what he sees? He sees the hearts. That's how well God sees. And he cares. Here's a second, third implication. Remember that you will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. Now, I know in the culture that we have today, people are wanting to try to erase consequences. But guess what? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. God is a just God, and there will be justice. Period. You will reap what you sow. There are consequences for choices that you make. Whether they're good or whether they're bad. But there's always consequences for choices. I think most of us understand this truth because we've seen it played out in our lives, right? Live for God. Live for God and reap His blessings. Live for Him. Final implication. Rest in the hope of God's promises. Rest in the hope of God's promises. Just as he promised Israel that they will have a future land and a blessing, so will he fulfill his promise of our complete salvation. You see, our lives are secured. Our eternity is secured. Why? Because he is a faithful God. That's why. If you're here this morning and you haven't placed your faith and trust in Christ for your salvation, you're currently under the judgment of God. You have no true hope in this life or the one to come. Will you turn from your sins this morning and embrace Jesus through faith in his work on the cross for your sins? That's your greatest need this morning. Would you pray? Thank you, Lord, for your word, your truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful God. Thank you that you are a just God. Lord, help us to be challenged by that. 
Help us, Lord, to take your word and apply it to our hearts and our lives. Lord, help us not just to be a hearer of your word, but a doer of it. And just as Micah in chapter 1 wants the whole world to pay attention to what is happening to Israel, Lord, may we pay attention to what Micah is prophesying against Judah. May we not make the same error. May we follow you with a whole heart in obedience to you and passion for you. And if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they would turn from their sins and by faith reach out to you and be saved today. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You may stand and we'll continue worship this morning. seated. All right. A couple of things before we dismiss with prayer. Uh, For those of you who are visiting and consider giving to the Lord as part of your worship time, I wanted to make you aware of a couple of offering boxes that we have in the back by the doorways. I know that our members and and frequent attenders are aware of those, but some of you who are new to our ministry may not know that that option is available for you, as well as online giving. Um, But that is very important. This morning, before uh, we dismiss, um, I want to say goodbye to a family that has been very precious to me uh, for 11 years. Um, The Ajo family, this is their last Sunday with us. Would you guys stand up? I know you hate being embarrassed. I have known them uh, since 2010. Uh, They were in Ottawa when we went down there to church plant, 
They lived across the street from us and uh, actually were there on contract work and then moved to Ottawa to become a part of that uh, church plant. <sighs> thought I could do this without emotion, but it's hard. Uh, they've become our dearest friends, and it's with great sadness but a little bit of joy as well to say goodbye to them. They are moving back to New Hampshire, um, where Calvin's family lives, and a lot, a lot of other family, like hundreds of family members live in this area. Uh, they've purchased property and are moving back there, and and I wanted to say thank you for your friendship, for your faithfulness. Um, Calvin has been at every Bible Institute I've taught. He's been a member of the leadership team. They've been involved in uh, Journey to Judea and on and on and on. And they were essential um, to Krista and I's survival in Ottawa. They've seen us at our worst, and they've seen us at our best, and they've still remained loyal friends. So as we dismiss, I'd like to pray for them. And if you know Calvin and Honey and would like to say goodbye, uh, please uh, do so. This is their last Sunday with us. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you um, that you are a true and faithful friend. Father, I pray for my friends, that you would go with them, that you would guide their steps that your spirit would speak loudly to their hearts, that your word would be the counsel that informs everything that they do. Father, I pray that you would use them to make disciples in this new place and that they would be as valuable to new friends there in this place as they have been to us here. Thank you for using them here at Countryside. Um, thank you for the way they have served us for over a decade, and I pray your blessing upon them and upon all of us, Lord, as we seek to live for the glory of Christ in this world. We pray this in his name. Amen. God bless you.